Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, Stuart gave me a great remit, uh, which I'll move on to. Bill, talk a little bit about your career, some of the things that have happened on the journey, and maybe a little bit about the future of corrosion and uh, renewable energy, because I've been in the energy stuff. So it's fairly broad. Um, there's my name there. One of my emails there is president at icor.org. I'm currently the president of the Institute of Corrosion, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on this afternoon. So what about me? Um, well, I started life as a chemist. Chemists make great corrosion engineers. And in my third year, uh, I discovered electrochemistry, um, which is a claim many people dispute, given the historical weight of evidence. But uh, I like to say that that's when I became an electrochemist and began my journey into corrosion. Um, you can tell how old I am because it was on rechargeable lithium batteries, which didn't exist at that time. So uh, I've got some years behind me in that space. I'm kind of glad I didn't stick with batteries because I would have been coming to fruition about now. And so I would have missed out on a lot of career. Um, I put the accreditations up, uh, not, not really to boast about them, but to say um, life and a career is a continuous journey and you should never stop taking on new challenges uh, and learning new things. So uh, that, that's why that, that's up there. And at the bottom, you can see I've had most of my experience in oil and gas. So that's this next slide um, here. Uh, interestingly, I've never been sure whether I really want to be an academic or an industrialist. And I started off doing a little bit of postdocing um, and working with carbon dioxide. I was actually in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology looking at uh, carbon dioxide content in the blood of prematurely born babies. Um, little did I know that carbon dioxide would have a massive influence on my life going forward. So it was a very uh, useful piece of, of work to have done. Um, then I moved into the world of corrosion and I worked with a company with the exciting name of Metal Box. And that is exactly what they made was Metal Box. It's tin cans, baked bean cans, beer cans. Um, and that's, got, that's what got me into corrosion. Um, it was a fun time because people were trying to put all kinds of new things into uh, metal cans. So we would be given gallons and gallons of fantastic red wine, put it into cans, do the corrosion testing, and miraculously, there was always plenty left over to take home at the end of the evening. So uh, that got me into corrosion. And then I moved into the world of oil and gas, and I joined Exxon Chemical, uh, mostly working on corrosion inhibitors, which I'm not going to talk about, um, and got into uh, a, a whole world of different corrosion problems, and some of those I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then I joined BP. Um, great, Dominic, to hear your presentation. I get so excited when people are still doing work on acetic acid. I'm not going to even touch on that in my talk, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, as you can see, I've um, taken on some non-executive directorship. Some of you will say it's not NACE anymore, Bill, it's AMP. And you're absolutely correct, but it was NACE when I was there. So uh, there we go. Um, oil and gas. I, I always feel obliged to show this chart. Do we really need it going forwards? Um, and here's a graph of uh, total energy from different sources Oops, on the left point um, against time. And you can see that for most of the last century, coal was the dominant energy source in the world. Uh, is that in the last year, the UK has actually started to not require coal at certain times of the year for power generation. But you can see that black line, uh, coal very dominant. And, and the, the emergence of oil and gas. But probably the most interesting curve is that sort of browny yellow one, uh, which is the renewables curve, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on. But you can see in that curve the rise of renewables. The line down the middle is kind of meant to be today. This, this data was taken from 2020. Um, and so going forwards from that line, that's a prediction. That's what people think may happen. What I find really interesting about that curve is if you look at the words further down, um, if you looked at the prediction Four years ago, in 2017, the prediction was that renewables 
would be about 15 percent of the of the energy mix of the world. When we looked at it in 2020, it's more like 50 percent. So renewables are going to become inc incredibly important. And that's great. But oil and gas is also going to be necessary for the next many years as well. So if any of you are thinking of a career in oil and gas, um, I would I would thoroughly recommend it. It's an exciting place to work. Um, I put this slide up. It's big. Everything we talk about in oil and gas is pretty much done in the billions of dollars. And we always work in dollars, but given the error bars in these numbers, you can think of them in pounds. OK, it doesn't really make any difference. Um, but just to give you an idea of, of the size of some of the oil and gas projects that, that are being talked about, um, the last two I've put question marks against. They may not happen given the current focus on, on the renewables and the desire to try and not use oil and gas if possible, but uh, gives you an idea of, of the kind of size of projects that um, people are talking about. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that happened in my career journey, um, some good things and maybe some not so good things. Mostly these days, in the old days, most of you in this room are old enough to remember this, um, we used to love talking about our failures. We always talked about failures. Oh, this failed and that failed. And here is a great picture of failure. Uh, of course, um, then the lawyers got involved and we pretty much don't talk about failures anymore, which is a real shame because that's how we learn when we have things that fail and, and, and we want to move forward. Um, but this one I can talk about because uh, it was so much in the public domain. And I'd uh, recently... Um, asked and being transferred to Alaska from Trinidad in the Caribbean, which is a great move of uh, tropics to Arctic in one go. Um, and I was there about six months and we had this oil spill. And I asked to go to Alaska because it was our flagship corrosion control program. It was the best corrosion control program we had in BP. And we had a spill about six months in. Um, it was a pipeline that was covered in snow. There was a small hole um, in the uh, six o'clock position at the bottom of the pipeline. Um, and uh, because it was covered in snow, the oil dripped out. It went underneath the snow. So it spread out for about two acres um, and you couldn't see it, which is why it took quite a long time um, to discover. Uh, I've got a picture here. A little bit more of a close up. There's the pipeline after the snow had been cleared away. You can see the brown color of the steel there, slightly rusty exterior. That's because we've now taken the other ones. Can you notice to the right, the one to the right of that looks bright and shiny and looks a bit corrugated. That's actually just a wrap around the pipeline that holds the insulation in. Um, so once all that's been taken off, you can see the pipeline and the leak that occurred there. And when we opened that pipe up, and this was done under the auspices of the Department of Transportation and all kinds of regulatory bodies. So I say when we opened the pipe up, we cut it out. We moved a transporter for glass windows all the way from Seattle up to Alaska because the Department of Transport insisted that we didn't disturb any sediments that we were believed to be in there. We put it on this loader, which allowed no vibration to occur on this pipe. And then it was driven 600 miles south down to um, uh, Seattle. Uh, I think that flatbed truck cost us about $4 million just to move the sample. When we got there eventually, you, there was indeed sediment in it. Um, we, you can see at the beginning of that, that shows a piece where it's been scraped off. You can see there's about four inches, uh, 100 centimetres of um, sediment in there. And if I flick on to the next slide, um, actually very hard to see, but that's what the pit uh, actually looked like. And it was about the size of an almond. And if I go, uh, let's have a look. Yeah, that's probably a good place. Um, these pits, um, you know, often you can get a piece of steel and it looks absolutely pristine. And you think, you know, when you think corrosion, you often think of a lot of corrosion surfaces. But these pits can be very isolated. 
and there is the pit on its own and there's the little hole that comes out the back end. It doesn't have to be that big because if you've got a lot of pressure in the pipe, it'll force the liquid out. I'll pass these around if you want to have a look. You can absolutely touch them. Uh, just be aware, they're a little bit heavy and they've got some sharp edges on them. So I take no accountability for you slicing your fingers open. Be, please be careful. So um, we did a lot of, uh, to, to, to understand this, we did a lot of things. Um, this is a, an inspection image. Um, this is each of those. Uh, what you've got to imagine uh, with this pipeline is it's a pipeline curved around like that, and we've opened it up like that. So running down the middle there is the bottom of the pipeline. And if you were to take that and curve it around at the top of that image and at the very bottom of that image, that's the 12 o'clock or the top of the pipeline there. And you can see blue, well, you can't tell this, but blue is basically no corrosion and red is corrosion. And you can see running right along the bottom of the pipeline, there were a series of these pits. Um, this comes from ultrasonic data. Um, just talking generally about uh, advances in technology. But um, when you first get these images, um, th this has been processed quite a lot, so even I can understand this image, but the raw data is hard to see. And sometimes these pits are hard to understand what they look like. But with the invention of things like 3D printing, um, you can today create images of what these pits actually look like. So you don't have to rely on looking at data. This isn't exactly this pit. This is a much more interesting one uh, from a different failure that we had somewhere in the world. Um, this was actually a piece of steel that had an internal coating of a corrosion resistant alloy on it, alloy 625 for those who are interested in steels. So where, when I do this, you can actually see a top layer of the corrosion res resistant alloy on top is here. So this is taking this kind of data and making these images and I'll, I'll pass this around. But what you can see with these images is that the holes, the pits that have been talked about this morning in the corrosion resistant alloy are quite small. But once the fluid penetrates through into the underlying steel, you can open this up and see that it eats away a lot more of the steel. So a great way to visualize what's actually going on and to enable you to think about hmm, how are we going to stop that corrosion that's underneath that alloy and under the pits under there? Or do we have to cut the whole thing out? These models cost about £100 to make. The data to collect that cost about £5 million. Pounds. OK. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this. You know, it's lovely to hear the science and everything, but there are consequences of having these kinds of failures, OK? Uh, and I'm just going to run through them. We got lots of attention. I mean, just about every regulator in the USA hated us. Um, we had big corporate uh, um, damage reputation problems. Um, we lost a lot of market value. Uh, Let's just talk about one of those things. National defense, none of us knew this. Turned out that because we had this leak, we disrupted the flow of oil to a refinery in Alaska. Some people knew this, but most of us did not know this. In Alaska is the front line aircraft defense network for the USA for bombers coming over from Russia. We cut off the supply of aviation fuel to the front line of the US defense. <laughs> For bombers coming over. So these things, you know, a corrosion engineer, you don't think about these things. And then suddenly someone says, did you know this? Uh, no, I didn't know that. The bottom right hand picture there is um, on, on the right there, Steve Marshall. He was our president of BP Alaska. And that's Bob Malone, the president of BP America, testifying to Congress uh, ab about this um, incident. Um, we were given huge targets and just told to do it. You will replace 16 miles of pipeline by this date. Uh, I don't know any of you who've been in engineering. Um, if you don't get time to plan things, the costs are exorbitantly stupid. And typically, if you can't plan a repair, the cost can be anywhere from 10 to 100 times more than if you actually have time 
to plan a repair. So we paid a lot of money. I can't talk about the specific costs other than to say just to pay, replace the pipes alone was $500 million. And there were a lot more costs than that. So uh, let me talk about the corrosion cycle. Um, good place to remember this. <laughs> Shall I skip over it? <laughs> um, yeah, when you've been found, so we pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor case of negligence. OK, if you get into the legality of a misdemeanor case, misdemeanor is the lowest case of negligence you can have. The other extreme is gross negligence, where we knew that was a problem and we deliberately chose not to do anything about it. That's gross negligence. Misdemeanor is essentially we were stupid. We probably should have known that was there. We probably should have done something about it, but we didn't. So you're on a different scale of things. Yeah, there's a lot of consequences. Uh, yeah, I had a grand jury hearing to see if I was uh, negligent enough to be put in jail. The company had a grand jury hearing. We did pay fines uh, and they were looking to put people in jail. Um, but in the end, no one maliciously did that. And actually, you know what? When these things get reported, the press have a view which may or not may or may not resemble reality. But the legal system is very fair and sensible. It doesn't take sentences out of context. It says, here's this paragraph, Mr. Hedges. Did you write that? Yes. Do you? Is that your own thoughts? Do you agree with that? Yes. They don't sensationalize stuff. So I was actually quite impressed by the legal system. I'm not sure that's everyone's case, but I was. So let's think about the corrosion cycle because it's a good time to do this. I'm probably going to miss out loads of my talk, but that's okay. Um, the corrosion cycle is real. And if you're actually operating equipment, uh, don't ever forget this. But when you build a new facility, it's lovely and shiny and beautiful. And you walk around it and you go, this is fantastic. And what seems to happen is people go, look, it's lovely and shiny. There's no corrosion. We don't need to do much with this. And then something happens, typically a leak or hopefully nothing worse than a leak. Um, and then when you move into phase two, which is the panic. Oh, my gosh, what just happened? We didn't expect this. Uh, you get huge overreaction. Money tends to get thrown at the problem at that point. It would have been nice if a little bit of that had been spent early on. Um, and you try and understand what's happened. And then you move to getting things under control. OK, we understand what happens. We've put programs in place now to make sure this doesn't happen again. And then I think all of you in this room will anticipate what the next piece is, which is over time, you kind of go, well, we've got everything under control, haven't we? We haven't had a, I think, I think we may have had a leak when Bill Hedges was here, but we haven't had one for 15 years now. So, you know, what's the problem? You get complacent, budgets start to get cut. And guess what? <laughs> you go back around the cycle. Don't ever believe this isn't real. We've all fallen into this trap. When things are going well, that's the time to be most concerned. Right, because you've got to be thinking, what is it I'm not seeing? What could go wrong? The reason we're all here, and it's great to see all of you here, is corrosion is still with us and it's not going away. And it has funny ways of catching us out. Right, let's, I said, I've got seven more minutes. Um, Dominic, I loved hearing about acetates. Uh, it's one of my pet topics. Um, in the oil and gas industry, um, CO2 corrosion, carbon dioxide corrosion is a big problem. Uh, it's been well understood for many, many years. Um, for those of you who may not have seen it, this is what carbon dioxide corrosion often looks like. Beware the engineer who comes to you and goes, oh, yeah, yeah, Bill, that's uh, CO2 corrosion, 2.5 millimetres a year. You can't do that by looking at samples. And I've brought another sample to illustrate that. 
This is also CO2 corrosion. It's absolutely polished smooth. And sometimes I ask people to explain why the difference, but I'll tell you. The reason is that this pipeline was at the bottom of the pipeline. It's CO2 corrosion. It would have looked a bit like that. But there was sand in the pipe, bottom of the pipeline that gently, as the fluids flowed over the top, just gently smoothed it like, like sandpaper. So you've got the same problem, but with very, very different morphology. So always be careful about uh, jumping to conclusion on what the method is Watch out for this Okay, so we knew about CO2 corrosion, um, but sometimes we found problems that we didn't understand. We were quite good at predicting corrosion. Shell, the, the oil company, did a massive amount of work uh, early on to understand CO2 corrosion. And on the, the little picture on the bottom right um, shows how we used to do early corrosion predictions. You used to uh, know what the temperature is, know what the concentration of carbon dioxide is on the right. You marked off those two points and joined them up. Um, but we started to notice some failures that couldn't be explained by carbon dioxide alone. And we began to suspect acetates. And um, I've just put on the bottom there, just so that you guys know, I will call it acetates. And it was great to hear Dominic call it acetic acid. Technically, ethanoate and ethanoic acid are the right terminologies. But um, for old people like me, it's, it's um, acetates. Um, it's quite obvious uh, that if you add acid to a steel, it will corrode. And the more acid you add, it will corrode more. There is a plot of corrosion rates on the left against time for adding different amounts of acetic acid. And you can see as you add more acetic acid, the corrosion rate gets higher. And um, the reason it tails off after a while um, is because it's a fixed volume of um, electrolyte and the acetic acid is consumed. No brainer. What was really in, we found was really interesting um, were these kind of graphs. Uh, the red, same graph, a corrosion rate against time, the same um, no acetic acid is the red line, uh, and you can see the pH there. I've got to read that one. So it's about 3.9, something, 4. 4. Um, if you add acetate iron as sodium acetate, so not acetic acid, sodium acetate. Sodium acetate, for those of you who are chemists, is the salt of a strong base, sodium hydroxide, and a weak acid, hydro uh, acetic acid. Um, so it actually tends to make the pH go up and becomes less acidic. And yet when you do that, the corrosion rate increases. And none of us could explain that at the time. Um, and I'm not, I can't bore you with the whole uh, story. Um, but ultimately what came out was an understanding of the interesting relate, chemical relationship between CO2 acetate and bicarbonate. Um, I won't go through all of this stuff, but today we really understand quite well the role of acetate and we can predict the um, uh, corrosion rates using that. Uh, I'm going to skip over all of this and talk to this and just before I finish. Um, what about the future? Well, we've just recently, I've been helping um, the Royce Institute based here. Um, along with Fraser Nash, look, doing a survey of the, it's called a landscaping exercise and the degradation of structural materials um, for what's called net zero. This is where the UK has committed to uh, having net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. Actually, more recently, they've strengthened that and there, there were quite some ambitious goals by 2030 which sort of brings it into the more realistic time frame now. That's kind of only, what, nine years away. So uh, that, that's important. I haven't got time to go through all of this. We focused on these industries here. Um, I'll let you read them for yourself. Uh, areas that could either um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions or use different types of uh, energy sources. Um, 
we were looking for opportunities primarily for research. You know, what, what does the UK need to invest in in research to make sure that we can meet these commitments to net zero? For example, we know today that um, we're investing heavily in offshore wind. Wind towers sit in the sea like oil platforms do, and they are still corroding. We maybe haven't learned all the lessons that the oil and gas industry learned over many years. Now, I'm not saying it's the same. There are distinct differences between a wind tower and an oil and gas platform, but maybe there's some stuff we could do better. So what kind of research things um, would we need to do? Um, we, we had lots of respondents, which was great. Uh, many covering all kinds of areas uh, of the sector. So we got some really, really good input. Um, here are the findings. Um, basically, no showstoppers. No one said we can't develop wind because we don't have this technology. So there's no showstopper. We can do these things. But what a lot of opportunities in the corrosion space to improve numerous opportunities. Um, there were lots of problems identified. I'm hoping it will please most of you in the audience to know that the number one issue raised by all the people building wind towers, solar, nuclear fission was corrosion. That is their number one issue of we're going to have problems with corrosion. So what you guys are doing is really important. And really, ultimately, what we called for was a roadmap. What the UK needs is what technologies are we really going to invest in? Because some of them compete with each other. So are we going to invest in all of them? And what do we need to do to get the biggest um, impact from our renewable industry? Uh, I'm going to skip over that and I'm going to skip over that and just show this last slide. Um, Interestingly, when we asked everyone, um, how good is the UK at doing research? Which is the blue bars there. You can see um, across different variables there. There was a feeling that UK is pretty good at research. When we asked, how good is the UK at turning that research into commercially useful things? The answers were still pretty good, but you can see that in industry there is a consistent view that we're not as good at turning great research into commercial activities. So for those of you in the audience, I think that's a great challenge. You know, how are we going to take a lot of the great stuff you're doing, but turn it into something that's commercially useful? So I've had a great career. I would encourage you to stay in corrosion. It's brilliant. Um, you can read it there. It's, it's important in all kinds of industries. There have been so many advances over the last 20 years. I've named a few of them there. Um, and oil and gas is great, but it's going to be important in the renewable industry as well. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Job applications? Yes. Hiya. Uh, thank you. Great talk. Um, you mentioned in one of your slides that the problem in Alaska was due to microbial induced corrosion. Um, are you allowed to say how you managed to sort that out when you replaced the pipe? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And actually, it's a great word. I mean, great debate. Is it influenced or is it induced? It's a great question, isn't it? Um, still don't think I know the answer to that myself. Um, well, I gave you a clue, actually. One of the mistakes we made, that was an oil line. OK. And it was what we call the money line. All right. It was pumping the oil off the site to the refinery. So we didn't want to do anything that would interrupt the flow of that oil through that line. And one of the things we didn't do that we should have done was put cleaning tools or what we call cleaning pigs into the line so that if any sediment did build up, we would sweep it out and not create that lovely environment that bugs love under deposits. They've got water. They've got oil. Unlike 
bugs. We can't eat oil for the energy, but bugs can. So having a nice cozy environment underneath the sediment with food, with nutrients, the main way we did it was we kept the pipeline clean. And then the inhibitors, the corrosion inhibitors, and the biocides that we used to keep the levels of bacteria down would work properly. Underneath that sediment, you add biocides in, they can't penetrate down to kill the bacteria. I'm a pacifist, by the way. But when it comes to bugs in oil pipelines, kill them all, okay? There's no other better option. Good, great, great question. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Bill, fascinating talk. Thank you. I, you didn't mention any sort of monitoring or detection. I mean, with things like your pipe, your neglect, your corrosion cycle, you know, can you get over the neglect bit by monitoring and protecting? Absolutely, you can, yes. And again, um, you know, w one of the mistakes we made was, hey, this is an oil pipeline. There's almost no water in it. Uh, it's not really going to be that corrosive. So we didn't put as much monitoring on that pipeline as we could. We didn't do as much inspection on that pipeline as we should have done. Yes, we could have. We'd have put more monitoring, more inspection on that pipeline. We we would have picked that up. And that's changed over the last, the, the possibility of doing that's changed drastically. Oh, drastically. Last, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I would say that in BP, um, but by the way, I, I took a voluntary redundancy from BP at the end of last year, so I don't work for BP anymore. Um, uh, we were almost moving to the point of saying you don't need intrusive monitoring. The external UT devices that you can buy are so good now that we're almost to the point of you don't have to poke things into the pipeline. Every time you cut a hole in a pipe and poke something in, you're creating a potential leak path. It's hazardous for people to do that kind of monitoring. So the advances in UT technology, both point UT and long range UT, absolutely. We, you can do a lot more today that we couldn't have done 15, 20 years ago. So you, UT being ultrasonic transducers. Sorry, ultrasonic testing, yeah, which is what the UT stands for. Correct. Thank you very much. Thank you. I always used to think that one of the problems with monitoring is that, again, people get complacent and they put it in the filing cabinet and forget about it. Is that still true? I hope it's not true, still true, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, yes. I mean, uh, you know, one of the great things about an oil and, a big oil and gas company is you have a massive amount of data. That's great, isn't it? Yeah. One of the downsides of having massive amounts of data is what do you look at? What do you make sure you check is really important? Yeah, and so you sort of do the things you've sort of always done in the past. And inevitably, when you look at a failure like I showed today, you can go through a whole series of these are the mistakes we made. No one was negligent. But when you look at it with hindsight, you go, yeah, we were a bit stupid. Uh, yes, hello. Um, there were two things on my mind, actually. One, one is wind, wind towers, offshore wind towers aren't painted on the inside. <laughs> and, and I heard that, that this was deliberate because, of course, all the oxygen in the tower will be consumed. Um, yes, I've heard that as and, well. And uh, that, that clearly is nonsense. So clearly, there's going to be a, a time in the near future where that will have to be corrected. Correct. Um, and the economics of wind towers... Or you make them out of non-corrosive alloy. Well, I understand the economics of wind towers. If you have to go and repaint them, you, you basically lose 10 years' profit. Correct. Um, Correct. So, uh, yes. Correct. Uh, Correct. One, one of the great findings in there, I mean, this is a crazy idea, but some people are so thoughtful. One of the findings they said was, let's just stop corrosion and let's use more stainless steels and alloys. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. They're not the panacea for all situations. But one guy said, the government should be subsidising us using stainless steels because in the long run, that will be much better for the country. Oh, it was a fascinating observation. Sorry, do, Stuart. do we have enough chrome and money to do that? Oh, that's another... Probably yes, but that's a great question, isn't it, as well? Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.